Welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Our guest today for the second of a two-part chat is one of America's most distinguished and experienced critics of theater, film, and literature, John Simon. <laughs> Welcome again to the show, John. Thank you. Thank you. The only other period of my life where I was uh, interviewing people, I, I did a brief stint uh, uh, in the, it was in the late 70s, and one of the people I interviewed was uh, uh, um, Charles Ludlam. And uh, he, uh, we, I talked to, to him endlessly, and one of the things he said was uh, his theory of what makes a good critic, and he said he got it from Goethe. This, this idea. Um, let me uh, um, run this by you. I, I like what he said. I doubt that it came from Goethe. I doubt it too. <laughs> but Charles had all these extravagant claims and I adored the man. Uh, he said the first duty of a, a critic is to report accurately what, uh, what he's seen. The second is to describe the goal of the artist uh, as the artist might see it, and judge whether or not the artist achieved that goal. And lastly, the critic should say whether this was all worth doing in the first place. Well, I have a, tri uh, a, a tripartite theory of what a critic should be as well. It's not quite the same, but there's a similarity. I think a critic should, first of all, be a good writer. I mean, as good a writer as any other kind of writer, poet, novelist, playwright, essayist, you name it, a really good writer. The second thing is for him to be a good teacher, because everybody's education stops too soon. And uh, people graduate almost as ignorant as they began. So therefore, the critic becomes the teacher who takes on the teaching job after the actual teachers stop. And the third thing is, for the critic to be a thinker, to think about the world we, l we live in and see the connection between the movies and the plays, or the books that he reviews, and the world as, it he, as he sees it, and make the necessary connections or disconnections. And that's it. So that's the goal. Yeah, and if you can do that, you, my, hat's, my hat's off to you. Well, I th it sounds similar to Charles' point. It's it's similar in some yes, ways. Yes, it does. I don't think whether the uh, whether the author accomplished what he set out to do is all that important, because if he sets out to do something crummy, <laughs> accomplishing it is no great thing. Right. Um, looking back, which theater developments or movements uh, did not live up to the claims made on their behalf? Well, again, it depends. I mean, I think absurdism for a while was a good thing. I mean, early UNESCO, and to the extent that he was part of it, though he denies it, Beckett, were good things, and maybe some of those lesser ones, too, although some of the lesser ones were much lesser. Uh, but um, then again, when, when other people took up absurdism and kept running it into the ground, it was not so good anymore. Uh, I, think, I think Arthur Miller, who made a name for him early, which I dispute, uh, became less and less good even than he was in the early plays. Um, poor old Tennessee Williams, who was wonderful, in his early and even middle period, became quite pathetic in his last plays. Um, I don't know. I don't know that there, w there was any school that was wonderful at one time and and horrible later on. That there weren't that many schools really to speak of. Well, there were fashionable directors and uh, oh, yeah. theater of director, uh, director kind of theater. Yeah. Well, directors' theater is a bad thing. It's always been a bad thing, and it goes on being a bad thing, and it doesn't go away. It's when the director thinks that he really creates the show and not the author. And he, without necessarily rewriting the words, he prides himself 
you know, the Peter Sellers type of director, Jonathan Miller, and all these other half-baked customers, uh, they think that because they respect the text by not changing it, they have not changed the play. But they've changed everything by what they do with that text, how they locate it in different periods, how they manipulate it, how they emphasize and de-emphasize, how they invent a scenario of actions that is totally unrelated to the text. I've never understood uh, 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 if Peter Sellers feels free to change the location of an opera, let's say, uh, and to uh, uh, provide a different context for the opera, why doesn't he feel free to change the music? What's so holy about the music? Well, if you feel if you are uh, if you're changing things, well, I think, I think it might be interesting actually. Well, I think because he wouldn't know how to change the music. Ah. He thinks he knows how to change everything else, but he knows that's the little that he does know. He cannot rewrite the music because he's not a composer. Well, he could hire someone to do so. But th my point is that it's sacrosanct. One thing is not the text is not sacrosanct. The context is not sacrosanct. But the music is, and it seems very arbitrary. Uh, uh, to d it might be interesting to open that up some sometime. Well, I mean, I think we should be thankful for small mercies. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that doesn't get changed, we should bless. If uh, you had your druthers, uh, I'd love to know if you know the origin of that one. I have no idea. What is a druther? I don't know that either. I'm, etymology is not my strong suit. Well, if you had them those druthers. Mm. Which areas in theater? Don't you think it might come from rather? I'd rather have that. And then the D gets attached to the rather, and, be, and you have druther. I don't know. That's just a guess. I thought they might be like suspenders. Suspenders? Yeah. Uh, which areas in the sh theater would you, would you like to improve? Well, I'd certainly like to have directors know their place which now they do not. Um, other than that, um, I also would like actors to have better elocution, better diction. This goes for singers, too, because unfortunately the microphone has made actors and singers lazy, and the, their delivery has suffered from it. Uh, how would you improve the quality of playwriting? You, you say that the, the writing there, uh, that theater was richer at one point. Well, you see, one of the big problems is that I think all the arts are up against this. It's particularly obvious in music to me, but also in painting, that so damn much has been done, and so very little can be found that hasn't been done yet without going completely off the deep end. Um, one can be different by being insane. One can be different by being disgusting. But, but that, that in itself is no longer different. Well, even that's no longer different. But, but it's very hard to be different in a valid, uh, significant, uh, constructive, uh, humane way that hasn't somehow been done before. Because I don't think there is an infinitude of plots or an infinitude of... Uh, of uh, descriptive adjectives, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the, the, the supply is perhaps unreplenishable. And then you're in trouble. I mean, you can combine these things differently, but it's very hard to come up with something really and truly different and new and still valid. I remember Arthur Kessler uh, uh, once was uh, in The Lotus and the Robot uh, uh, his uh, claim that uh, Japan had run out of, uh, mathematically, had run out of new haikus in the 18th century, that there are only a limited number of haikus possible in the, ja I, I don't know Japanese, this could all be nonsense as for all, as for all I know, well, but it's a thought. Uh, I've I never heard that expressed. I John. don't know. When you exhaust the haiku, you can always try the low Q. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are you envious of theater in other countries? Yes, yes, in England, certainly. What are you envious about? Well, I mean, the English are more open to literary plays. Over here, it's mostly entertainment. 
and everything else comes second or third. And in England, they, I mean, it's gotten worse because they've become Americanized, as has the continent. A very unwholesome thing, I would say. Um, not that America doesn't have its strength. I mean, the musical comedy is a great thing. And That's not English at all. It's, it's American. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the good sort of solid playwriting that Europe has always been good at has suffered a lot from Americanization, but it's still different, and it still holds up its own, and you still get an occasional writer from Germany, France, England, maybe Italy and Spain, less often, uh, uh, sometimes from Poland, um, Hungary, who um, are real writers, and they don't get done in America, you, certainly not on Broadway. There's no, not much theater to speak of in, uh, in France. It's, it's, uh, no, but it's theater until, poor. until recently there was. I mean, when it was Giraudou and Anoui, uh, it was, and a few others uh, wh whom I could name, uh, uh, there was still theater in, in, in France. Beckett, too, who was a French playwright in some ways. Are there certain genres that are incapable of being art, great art? Mm, probably. I Can a musical be great art? I think so. I think, uh, I think um, Sondheim's Follies, I think, is great art. Uh, I think... Uh, I think Adam Gettle is, is on the verge of creating great art, very close to it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think Pal Joey may be great art too. Uh, there, are, there are things I think that are great art. They may be great art of a more popular kind. They are Dickens, let us say, rather than Proust. But still, that, that is great art. Uh, I think pornography is hard to make great art of, but I'm not sure that it's impossible. <laughs> uh, did, you, uh, um, did you like the sensibility of pop art? No, no, I can't say I did. So that would be there, uh, so a pop art, uh, a piece of pop art would <laughs> hardly be you know, a, a deplorable thing now is all these musicals based on cartoons and comic strips, I, and the movies based on them, too. I find that not very satisfying. Even, uh, even though the, the, the French have some uh, comic strips, uh, uh, Versailles Yeah, Versailles yeah, that's, that's a higher type of comic So there they, they have uh, tried to turn the comic book into quote, art. Yeah, well, Baba is not bad either. So there it's possible. Uh, there yeah, I think there is something left of the old European culture that still uh -huh. survives. And there they're taking what are essentially, in, in that case, it's an American, it's an American genre, and so they're franchising it. Yeah, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, are there any, any genres or works or writers uh, for whom you will confess a visceral, a visceral, irrational dislike. Visceral and dislike, I will concede, but irrational, I will not. <laughs> <concede>. <laughs> so you'll back. You have no. What I'm driving at is, did you have a, a, a prejudice oh, yes. that you can confess to? Yeah. Well, I don't think <laughs> of them as prejudices. I think they're okay. judices, not prejudices. Okay. David Bennett, for one, who I think. Uh huh. Tony Kushner, for another. I think these are pretty awful people. Uh, they're not totally without talent. I don't dispute that. But the bad in them far outweighs the good. And you see this as taste, your taste, rather than a... Um, I think everything one says is one's taste. There's no getting outside one's taste. I, I for, we were talking about um, uh, uh, Salome by Richard yeah. Strauss. Yeah. And I, had, I confessed that the Oscar Wilde play nauseates me and the opera nauseates me, but I think they are great pieces of art, both of them. I think the play and the opera are brilliant, and I can't bear them. I get physically ill when I see them. I just can't stand the taste. 
Is there, well, I don't uh, know. I think that's my that's my problem with them. I, I think Salome has has a great relevance to our time. Absolutely. Just, just think if all these great born again Christians had their heads lopped <laughs> off, it would be a much better world. <laughs> um, it it didn't disturb. It, I um, I see this as as a uh, a limitation of mine, and uh, well, I suppose I could rationalize it. Um, yeah. I could figure out a, a theory to well, go along with that. Yeah, well, I think it's true. I mean, no one has a taste from A to Z. I have no use for Mozart. I have no use for Bach. I have very little use for Beethoven. I'm sure in the eyes of most people, and certainly in the eyes of more musicians and people who write about music, as I do, that's a sin against the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, Mozart and, um, and Bach bore the pants off me. And since I'm not an exhibitionist, uh, I don't <laughs> see any point in that sort of thing. Have you ever considered reviewing television? Uh, no. No, because I'm even tough on respectable forms. So on television, I would be intolerably tough. You're not a fan of uh, a cable TV, HBO, or... Um, yeah, they do things occasionally that are good, I'm, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, six Feet Under. Um, so I'm told. I haven't really seen haven't Six Feet Under. Uh, but uh, it's hard enough to keep your head up six feet above. Um, <laughs> Sex uh, in the City, it hasn't lured you? No. No. Not, nothing that has Sarah Jessica Parker in it <laughs> <laughs> will ever lure me. I see. Uh, there we have to agree to disagree. Uh, she's a neighbor of mine, and I adore her. Well, maybe I live in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, I noticed that uh, uh, one of my favorite reviews that I, I saw of yours was uh, your review of The Green Bird. Which I like I, that. And I, I understand is coming back. Nobody else seemed to like it. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... I uh, I felt that it was one of the best things of, the, of that year, and it's it's being brought back. I well, think it's Julie Taymor is very talented, and now that she has sort of made it with, you know what, um, I guess perhaps her other works will come into their own as well. And I'm uh, I'm I was really particularly interested because I'm directing uh, the Blue Monster by the same writer here in the. Uh, in the spring of, uh, it'll be the spring of 2007. Who is the same writer? Uh, uh, Gutsy, Carlo Gutsy. Oh, Carlo Gutsy, yes. Carlo. And uh, uh, to a lot of people find him an obscure writer to me. No, he's not. He's obscure, but undeservedly so. Uh, interesting writer. You know, yeah. And, um, and I, I find that uh, uh, in your writings, I, I find a quirkiness that I find very uh, refreshing. I never know what I'm going to find. That I've been told by other people that they can't predict which Sometimes way. it's infuriating, but yeah. I, I find it uh, uh, unpredictable. Yeah, I have nothing against being predictable if that is right. But so often it's not right. And being unpredictable has a good chance of opening up doors that should be open. If you were a young, uh, one of my young students here who wants to be a critic, uh, what would you suggest that person do? Well, I think it's important to read more. People don't read enough. They watch television too much. They play with the computer too much. They do all kinds of other things uh, too much. Um, I think it's very important to be a well-read person because that's the only easy way to get at all the great things of the past. If you wait for them to appear on television, you will grow wait a long them, time. Yeah. Uh, are there any areas that uh, critics should cover now that they're not covering? Well, I don't know. Uh, I think you cover what's around, pretty much. And in as much as some of the good things are not around anymore, you can't cover them, no matter how good your intentions are. If the theater gave us more of the important works from the year one on, then the critics would have better chances to shine. But I was uh, uh, I was working on a piece in uh, that the, at the Lyric Opera of Chicago, so I spent a lot of time in Chicago, 
and I was uh, shocked at the the high quality. Uh, my, it was my provincialness showing because uh, uh, I was shocked how good theater in general was and how much of it there was in Chicago. And uh, uh, do you ever go to other cities or hanker to do that? Well, there was a time when the Rockefeller Foundation sent me out to think, see things, but only if you write for like the Times, which does send you out. Uh, but the publications I write for are too poor to send me or too uninterested. And on my own, I can't afford it. Right. I, I, so I wonder, I, I, I felt uh, going to the theater in Chicago, I, I saw this strange production of My Fair Lady done with two pianos, which was dazzling. It shouldn't have been dazzling, but it was dazzling. And I was wondering how much I was missing, and uh, uh, that's why I asked that question. I just wonder, what am, what am I seeing? Yeah, well, I'm sure there are great things going on everywhere in the world. Unfortunately, we can't cover them all. Um, there was something in physics about one body not being able to be in two places. Seems to apply here. Now, you review art as well as... Uh, I used to. I've done it occasionally since, yeah. Do you have the same feelings about the world of art as you have about uh, the world of theater and the world? Oh, if anything, worse. Well, worse. Like, uh, I think much of modern art is absolutely deplorable, unspeakable. For any particular reason? Uh, um, well, again, it's, it's the thing of, of having painted themselves into a corner. <laughs> They have to go somewhere else. And the only other place after the corner is the loony bin. And that's where they're ending up. When, when, you, when, when, when a shark becomes, you know, a, a processed shark becomes a work of art, we're in big trouble. You mean? Uh, uh, Damien Hirst. Or vivisection, uh, not well, vivisection, but dissections of bodies. Yes, that. Well, but I mean uh, also a lot of abstract art, I find. You know, starting with Jackson Pollock, I find. It leaves you cold. Uncountenanceable. Uh, are you a, a fan of the uh, Painted Bird, the uh, uh, Tom, um, why am I blocking his name? Uh, wonderful book on. Uh, oh, Kozinski? Yerzy uh, Kozinski? Uh, no, the painted word. Oh, is the painted the, word. Yeah. Who, who, what's is that? Tom. Uh, Tom Wolfe. Tom Wolfe. Uh, yeah, that, I thought that was an underestimated book for obvious reasons. Uh, do you think that uh, th it's for the same reason art has gone, in your opinion, has gone downhill for the same reason that uh, theater has, uh, that we've run out of uh, uh, subjects and or treatment yeah, or well, music has suffered in the same way too. Uh, I think many major modern composers are totally unlistenable to, for my money. Um, but uh, I mean, someone like Stockhausen or Fernie Ho or of the, any number of them, Ligati, you name them. So they, it's not music. Uh, some of Boulez, um, a lot of others. Um, well, yes, it's, it's desperation, you know, they, they, they do not want to repeat what's been done, for which I don't blame them, and yet they're compelled to do something. Of course, it would be good if they were compelled to do nothing. <laughs> You've mentioned uh, Adam Gettle and Light and the Piazza as a, uh, as a promising new work and yeah. direction. Yeah. Uh, uh, also yeah. Floyd Collins, his previous yeah. thing, which was Floyd very Collins. Uh, Tina Landau collaborated with yeah, him on that mm -hmm. one. Did, did you, uh, um, there, for a while it was thought that, uh, can, that musicals were a dying form. Uh, do you feel that way now, or do you see hope? Uh, well, a it's, more hope? it's hard, you know, it, I, in musicals especially, but largely not because it's been exhausted so much, but because when pop music was Tin Pan Alley, which was very close to show music, then show music could really unfurl its talents. But when, t when, when the pop music is rap and punk and rock and schmuck uh, and all of those things, then the theater, unfortunately, cannot go its own direction completely. And it falls prey to these awful forms of pseudo-music and starts emulating them. And then that's the end of the music. 
we have another direction that musicals uh, uh, have gone into, which is uh, um, uh, Lloyd Andrew Lloyd Webber has has been writing what amounts to operas mm. uh, in musical in musical form uh, in American musical form, uh, and even uh, Adam Ghetto is influenced by uh, yeah. Light in the Piazza is very influenced by uh, Grand Opera. Sure, uh, but again, it depends on who who or what your influence is. If you are influenced by, I don't know, by, let's say, Richard Strauss, that's not a bad influence. If you are influenced by Offenbach, that's not so good. Uh, although it's not that bad either, but it depends. Um, Puccini is a dangerous model, and he is the model for uh, Lloyd Webber, pretty much. I thought Mascagni myself. Oh, well, maybe that. Uh, I think what the greatest, uh, to my mind, the greatest piece of musical, of one-sentence musical criticism that's ever been produced was produced by an English humorist who wrote under the pseudonym Non de Plume Beachcomber, who said, Wagner was the Puccini of music. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Um, I think we have to wind up now. Uh, it's been such a, uh, I can't believe the, our time is over, uh, but it is. I, I, I want to thank you for being on Conversations, and uh, I, I look forward to uh, talking with you again sometime. My pleasure to Thank you for the second part. Thank you. Uh, thank you, our studio and theater audience, for coming today to Conversations. Uh, we'll see you again.